Good afternoon and welcome to SCI Health and Safety webinar. Thanks to all of you for attending uh, this webinar. For those who don't know, this week is the Fire Prevention Week, so I'm very happy to be here with you and discuss portable extinguisher. My name is Valerie. I'm the marketing advisor for SBI since five years now, and I have two guests with me today. Chris Kosnick is the business development manager for SBI, and Liz McKay is the Eastern Canada territory manager for Special Azores Johnson Controls. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Very quickly, I have to go through technical stuff before we start the webinar. So just so you know, this webinar will last for 45 minutes. We welcome your questions and comments at any time during the webinar. So please don't hesitate. Use the Q&A box. We want to hear from you. If you have anything in mind, um, something you want to share, a question, uh, again, please don't hesitate. Let us know, uh, what, let us know your questions. Please note, uh, you will receive a link to replay this webinar at your convenience. If you need more information, if you need any support, uh, you can contact me directly by email. Um, today, the webinar will be divided in three parts. Uh, Liz will discuss the National Fire Protection Association standard, and she's going to go over the fire classes and agents and the type of extinguishers that are available and Chris will uh, give us some information about the proper use of fire extinguishers, and um, he will give information about inspection and maintenance. So without further ado, I will now leave the floor to Liz McKay. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, thank you, everyone online, for joining and giving me the opportunity to talk about my passion. I would love to start off today uh, just with a quick reference to the National Fire Protection Association, that's NFPA 10. It's a, a, an independent body that publishes different standards for different industries, but for um, our information today, it is their standard 10 that provides the requirements that ensure portable fire extinguishers will work as they are intended, and that is to provide the first line of defense against fires of limited size. This standard sets out the type of extinguisher that you'll need for a particular occupancy or business or environment, um, the type, the location, how it performs. And they publish these recommendations about every five years in conjunction more or less with the intervals of the building code because the two go hand in hand. Um, the recommendations in this standard are very highly regarded and generally speaking, are what's adopted into the fire code that becomes enforceable law. Um, for our purposes today, it's important to note that manufacturing, our manufacturing from Ansel Fire Protection Products, manufacture to the latest standard at all times, so our extinguishers are always compliant. One of the things that the National Fire Protection Association defines is types of fires. And you may be familiar with some of these symbols. They define the actual fuels or classification of fires, and that lends itself to the types of fire extinguishing agents you'll require. Briefly, the first type you would be familiar with is A-class fires, which are ordinary um, hazards, ordinary combustibles. I like to think of those as those producing ash, A for ash, and that would be wood, paper, and so on. The second one you might be familiar with is the B class, which are flammable liquids or gases, and I remember those as things that come in a barrel or, or boil. Those are really not just what you might think of from an industrial perspective, gas, propane, diesel, but these can also include commercial items, things in your business, uh, in, in your um, storage uh, office storage rooms, household items, what's under your sink, you know, alcohol, all of these things could be considered B-class hazards. And the third one you're probably most familiar with is C. And C would go along with A and or B-class hazards. And C is a kind of a, kind of a misnomer. There's no real C-class fires. C represents that the A and the B fire suppressing agents have non-conductive properties. So that means that if you are using the extinguisher to, to suppress a fire where perhaps there's electrically energized, 
energized equipment involved, that you're going to have minimum potential of shock, minimum potential of uh, conductive property with that. The two lesser known are d class which are burning metals. We'll talk about those briefly. And k class which is a subclass of B, if you're in the commercial kitchen industry or commercial restaurant industry, you might be familiar with those designed specifically for commercial kitchens. Probably the single most important component of any fire extinguisher is the agent contained within the extinguisher used to suppress the fire. And there's several, there are many types, but there's several uh, five common types that you're going to be familiar with. The first is dry chemicals, so the ABC dry chemical or DC dry chemical, dry powders that are used specifically for D class, those very high hazard areas, clean agents the halogenated type agents and, and new type clean agents, liquids, and gases, the most familiar um, or common being CO2. Those agents would be stored in one of two main types of extinguishers or hand portable extinguishers. The one that you would see on your left, uh, known as stored pressure extinguishers, meaning that the agent and the pressure required to push the agent out of the unit are stored in the extinguisher. And in order to see that it's uh, in, in operating condition or to give reasonable insurance it's in operating condition at all times, most stored pressure extinguishers have a gauge that will indicate that they're properly pressurized. On the right hand side you'll see the second choice which are cartridge operated units and those are the units that are best suited for heavy industry, high hazard industry, and the agent is stored inside the canister as it is with stored pressure, but the expelling gas is stored outside. So speaking first to stored pressure extinguishers, ABC dry chemical extinguishers, BC dry chemical extinguishers are designed for light ordinary hazards such as hotels, schools, hospitals, libraries. These are the ones that if the fire inspector comes into your business or into your um, place, into your residence, if you have um, a requirement for that, would and advises you that you require an extinguisher, they are generally talking about ABC, dry chemical stored pressure units. And these are known as compliance units in order to comply with the fire code. Uh, the next most common would be CO2. CO2 is the original clean agent. It comes from the atmosphere and when it's used it goes back to the atmosphere. Uh, so considered the original clean agent, it is excellent at suppressing certain types of fires, not effective on A class, but very good at effect, uh, very effective at small BC type fires and hazards. In line with CO2, is the manufactured clean agent, and these are the halogenated agents. Um, they leave no residue, they are very low toxicity. They, we're working constantly to come up with new clean agents to minimize uh, any impact on the environment, long-term impact on the atmosphere. The current unit available, the Clean Guard agent, has gone through extensive testing um, and is very well suited for computer rooms. In fact, the clean guard agent, if used in a computer room or on a laptop type fire, will not do any damage to the data contained or saved or stored within that hardware. Uh, any damage that might be done, of course, would be done by the fire, but if you were to use a dry chemical extinguisher on a laptop, for example, the dry chemical itself would probably destroy the data whereas this clean agent would not. So it's uh, very good for computers, computer rooms, data storage rooms, even electrical panels. I mentioned earlier that K-Guard is, is one of the newer additions to the five classifications for fire suppression, and it is a subclass of B. It was introduced because the cooking media in commercial kitchens now is synthetic, it can get to very high temperatures very quickly 
and is contained within sophisticated appliances that are extremely well insulated. So you've got a much, much higher hazard or higher risk of fire in commercial kitchens these days than you would even 20 years ago. So the requirement for fire extinguishers in commercial kitchens changed from dry chemical to a liquid. And you'll note from the K class it's a stainless steel shell because it contains a liquid. The reason for that is a liquid will also provide cooling properties. So it will suppress the fire, say in a, in a fryer, it will suppress the fire by separating the, the hot fuel from oxygen, but at the same time, the liquid's going to act to cool that fuel, to cool that grease below the point of reflash. So it is now required uh, in NFPA for three of the last, uh, all three of the last editions of NFPA 10, which means it's probably been adopted into most fire codes. It is required to be in commercial kitchens now instead of dry chemical. We have water extinguishers, which was the original fire extinguisher. It's still a great uh, fire extinguisher for class A combustibles, but being water, it conducts electri uh, electricity. So it has very limited application in a, in a household or in a business or, or heavy industry. Um, it also has some inherent challenges in that it freezes. Uh, and it turns to steam. So limited capacity, still good, lots of it around and very inexpensive, but unfortunately we're not able to use it in, in very many applications. Introduced in the last three uh, editions of NFPA Standard 10 and now adopted into code in most jurisdictions is the requirement for a high flow extinguisher. What that is, is dry chemical extinguishers that will expel out of the extinguishing unit or the canister at a rate of one pound or more per second. Again, this is NFPA, which has been adopted into force enforceable code. The requirement for high flow is in areas where you have high hazards. Those are defined as any kind of pressure gas, uh, in environment, any kind of environment where you might have flowing fuel. So for example, if you had racks with barrels and, and one were to be punctured, you would have flowing fuel from that barrel gravity fed to a spill fire on the ground. In these environments, the code dictates that you have a high flow extinguisher. What these extinguishers do is deliver more suppressing agent faster than typical compliance units therefore increasing the potential of knocking that fire down quickly and at the incipient stage before it can propagate and before you, you have a bigger fire on your hands. So some of the examples of those environments, it could be anything from a construction site to a fuel station, gas stations will need to comply in the future, in the near future, maintenance facilities, right to offshore platforms and all forms of transportation. So there's going to be a, a huge requirement for these being enforced in the near future. So that's, in a nutshell, the stored pressure uh, options for hand portable fire extinguishers. It's important to know the right tool for the right job, and your selection can be based on the hazards that you identify and the area that you need to protect, and the type of agent that's appropriate to apply to those fires. Just to resume a little bit, um, uh, I suggest that we go with the questions now, Lee, that you presented the different type of extinguishers, the classes and agents. Um, so we're going to launch a question. We invite you to answer. Uh, we'll be looking at the answer after uh, together. And uh, this is going to give us the opportunity to look at a concrete example. So the question is, in the event of a fire on a conveyor motor in a swarm mill, which of the following extinguishers will be the most effective? From, from what we just saw, would it be ABC uh, water extinguisher, water extinguisher, CO2 fire extinguisher, DBC powder cartridge extinguisher, or E, the clean agent? We're going to give you a little bit of time um, to vote and answer that question. Uh, uh, and, and after that, we'll be looking at the answer. Do you expect any answer, Lisa, here? It could be a little tricky. There's, there's, 
there's more than one right answer, there's more than one possible answer, but there definitely is a best answer. Okay, so we're going to close the poll and, and I'm going to give you the answer right now. So we have 36% of the people who answer A, 27 who answer C, and 36% who answer E. So I think we have like, different answers here. What would be the good answer? The best answer would, in fact, be ABC powder. Uh, the reason being in a sawmill, you're going to have Class A combustibles, most likely have Class A combustibles on that motor uh, at the proximity to the conveyor itself. The motor is going to have grease and other Class B materials, and it may well be running at the time that it may be maybe the reason why there was a fire was because it was running hot. So you want something that has the C rating. So the ABC powder would be the primary choice. Certainly CO2 being BC would be effective. Um, it would not leave the residue of dry chemical, but it would not be as effective on any A-class material. And just as with the CO2, clean, any other clean agent would have the same impact. In fact, you could get larger clean agent extinguishers with that A rating in it. So all three answers would be right, but at this time A would be the best. The best. Interesting. So we'll look at a, another example. Same thing. We give you a question and we invite you uh, to, do, to, to choose an answer between A, B, C, D, and E. We're going to launch the question. In the event of an electrical panel fire, again, what type of fire extinguisher will be the most effective? So I think we're looking at the same kind of answer here. We might have different uh, options, but what will be the most effective in, in that specific question? I see there's a couple of you that already voted. I'm just going to wait a little bit and give some time for the people who did not. Um, okay, so we'll close the vote. And I'm going to give you the answer right now. So we have 32% of the people who answer A. Again, 26% of the people who answer um, C, CO2, and 26% of the people who answer E. So it's similar to, uh, to the, uh, the, the first question. Similar to the first time. Well, this time the answer I, I understood 26% for C and 26% for E. That's correct, yes. They would both be right. We we would look for a clean agent that has a C rating with an electrical panel. There is very low, uh, very low presence of A-class materials, maybe some, some coating on the wires, that, that type of thing, but an insufficient enough amount that we would not consider A to be a high priority in the rating. CO2 would be effective, but due to the properties of CO2, uh, it could, in fact, build up crystals, when it expels, it gets extremely cold. Even though it, it, it is correct as BC, we would go with clean agent because uh, it does not have that potential for crystallization when it expels. It does have the C rating, and it is a clean agent and will won't gum up the, the panel. It will have minimum long-term damage on that panel. I see that 5% of the people who answer B is water extinguisher. You want to talk a little bit about that? So, yes. Um, water extinguishers have only an A rating. Water is very, uh, uh, does conduct uh, electricity. <coughs> it is very definitely the extinguisher that you do not want to use and probably want to make sure that it is nowhere in the vicinity of the electrical panel so that it could not accidentally be picked up and used on a live electrical panel or other live electrical uh, appliance. Interesting. Thank you. So again, if you have other questions, uh, feel free to write to us. I'm looking for your questions. And with that being said, uh, we will continue with you, Lee. So moving on to the cartridge-operated extinguishers, this is specifically is the Ansel Redline extinguisher. Again, the cartridge is contained in a separate cylinder on the outside of the extinguisher. Uh, three of the four uh, uh, units that you can see on the slide right now are, have that separate expellent gas covered by a cartridge guard. Uh, the smaller one on the left-hand side of the picture, it's actually dropped down inside the cylinder. It hangs like a light bulb on that dome cap. 
But what that means is that the cylinder itself is not under constant pressure. It is only pressurized when you need to use the unit. There are some advantage, advantages to that on the lifespan of the unit, but it also means that you can open up the unit at any time, check it for maintenance, check the condition of the dry chemical, um, and it is, it's just easier to maintain. Now, these are extremely heavy-duty units. They are intended for very heavy industry, the heaviest of industry. In fact, we call them built for tough customers. Uh, one of the advantages, or, or one of the greatest advantages of this unit is if you're in a remote location, if you're in a, you know, mining or underground or offshore, when you use this extinguisher, you can recharge it yourself. We call this field filling. Once you expel the cartridge that charges the unit so that you can use the extinguisher, you can simply unscrew the cartridge from the side of the unit, unscrew the cap on top, refill dry chemical into the unit, replace the cap, and then put on a fresh cartridge and basically be back in business in about five minutes rather than having to send the extinguisher out for recharge. So it's extremely handy for those remote locations and used worldwide in, in heavy firefighting. Okay. These units also are available in high flow, which again means they expel dry chemical at a rate of one pound or more per second. And of course, we need them here in Canada, low temp, they go down to minus 65, or tested and approved down to minus 65, they'll actually perform at lower temperatures. And yes, that's uh, minus 65 Fahrenheit. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, the environments that they're best suited for, heavy-duty environments, mining, aviation, POG, all, offshore, all of those. The last class of uh, classification, which we haven't touched on, is that class D, that uh, the classification is for burning metals, such as magnesium, titanium, sodium, all of those, that tend to burn at extremely high temperatures, 1,200, 1,400 degrees, um, and they often give off their own oxygen, so they self-sustain. You need oxygen for the process of combustion, which is fire, uh, and if they produce their own oxygen, they can self-sustain in, in very small uh, environments and often undetected, and quite frequently, they react violently with water. So these require special powders, dry powders, not dry chemical, and certainly you don't want to be using liquid on these. And the last uh, extinguisher type to talk about today is the wheeled unit. And these wheeled units are basically big red line units. They have uh, external cartridges. The tanks themselves aren't charged until you need to use the unit. They are large volume dry chemical units for large hazards, such as airports or um, tank farms, where you're going to find large, large volumes of Class B liquids. These units can be filled with 150 or 350 pounds of dry chemicals, so by default they're all high flow, and they're fully operable by one person. And that, that wraps up the different types of agents and different models of hand portable, portable extinguishers. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. <coughs> We're starting the second Part of our webinar, uh, Chris will discuss a little bit about the use of extinguishers and the maintenance and inspection. Whenever you're ready, Chris. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about the proper use of fire extinguishers. Um, have you ever heard about PATH? Well, it's an acronym that we use to describe how to use a fire extinguisher. It stands for P-A-S-S. -S. The P stands for pull. We want to pull the pin prior to using the extinguisher. The A stands for aim. We want to aim at the base of the flames, not, or sorry, the base of the fire, not the flames. Uh, the first S stands for squeeze. We want to squeeze the carry handle and the discharge lever to expel the agent. And the last S stands for sweep. While discharging the extinguisher, we want to move slowly towards the fire in a sweeping motion, side to side, until the fire extinguisher, until the fire is um, extinguished. It's very important before using a fire extinguisher, you want to make sure that um, 
the area is evacuated. Uh, you don't want to attempt to fight a fire unless the alarm is sounded. Uh, you want to make sure the fire is small, it's contained. Uh, you're not in any immediate danger. You have a safe egress route. And uh, if in doubt, well, we use the term evacuate. Next uh, on our slide, it uh, shows training. We have a picture here showing a live uh, fire demo. If you require live fire extinguisher training, it is offered. This is a service that SPI provides. We use a uh, propane fuel fire pan controlled by a uh, dead man switch so that uh, we are in control of the fire at all times. Uh, a lot of uh, different companies and agencies really like the service because it allows their staff or their personnel to uh, obviously use a fire extinguisher and uh, hopefully if uh, they were ever in a situation where there was a small fire, they have that confidence to uh, handle it. Next we're going to talk about um, inspections and maintenance. So periodic inspections required according to standards. There are several different types of periodic inspections that are required. Today we're going to be talking about what to look for when we're performing our inspections. One of the first things you want to make sure is you want to make sure that the correct types of fire extinguishers are in the appropriate areas to the risks and the environment that they're in. <clears throat> we also want to make sure that we have the sufficient quantities of fire extinguishers this can vary depending on your industry. Uh, as we know, there's always different specific hazards and uh, with the different industries, there's also different spacing requirements. We want to ensure that the uh, extinguishers are properly mounted and secured. We also want to make sure that there's no obstructions. These extinguishers, um, they need to be visible. They need to be accessible. Very important. Um, also, accessories are available to help with visibility, such as signage. Signage, uh, we see it uh, sometimes when we're out. It's, on, uh, it's posted on walls, it's posted on columns, or it may even be on doors, uh, saying fire extinguisher inside, or if we're out shopping in department stores, you might see it on a column way up high saying fire extinguisher. So there is uh, definitely different uh, accessories available to help assist us in uh, locating and finding extinguishers. We also want to make sure that extinguishers, that they're in good working condition. So what is, what is good working condition? When we talk about uh, stored pressure extinguishers with the gauge, we want to uh, make sure that the, the, um, the pressure is in the green. It's indicating the correct pressure. We also want to make sure uh, when we're checking extinguishers that don't have gauges, that they have the correct weight. So this can be done by a, a number of ways. One is obviously weighing the extinguisher or um, hefting the extinguisher, lifting it. Uh, so we want to make sure the extinguisher uh, has the correct pressure or the weight. Also when we're checking the extinguishers, you want to make sure that that placard, there's a placard on the front of the extinguisher. You want to make sure that the operating instructions are legible. And um, we also want to make sure that the, the seal that holds that pull pin in place on the extinguisher is not broken, it's not missing, uh, that it's intact. We de definitely don't want to have an accidental discharge. And um, also that there's no signs of obvious damage, such as uh, large dents, corrosion, uh, leakage. We want to make sure that that, uh, that hose isn't cracked in any way, it's secure, and that the uh, nozzle is not blocked. There are different types of inspections. Um, we're going to run through uh, the two main ones. One is uh, the monthly visual inspection. So this is required every 30 days or sooner, depending on your company's policies. It can be conducted by uh, your health and safety rep, uh, yourself if you're considered competent, or uh, a, a service technician. We also have uh, yearly maintenance, and this needs to be completed by a a qualified and certified company. Whenever we're doing our periodic inspections, whether it be yourselves or us, we want to ensure that uh, the extinguishers don't require any maintenance. So some of the maintenance that could be required when we're checking our fire extinguishers could be the six-year takedown, the 12-year uh, hydrostatic test, or potentially an extinguisher could require recharging, and that could be at any time. 
during our maintenance inspections, uh, if the extinguishers are in their proper locations and they're found to be fully operational and that they're not requiring any maintenance, we affix a tag uh, onto the extinguisher to show that it's uh, certified. The tag, as in the illustration here, it has a lot of important information. Uh, the tag usually has the uh, type of extinguisher punched out. It also shows the year in which the extinguisher was inspected and also the month that the extinguisher was inspected in. On the reverse side of the tag, you'll often find the date uh, that the technician would um, write down, so the date that the actual inspection when it was conducted, and you'll also find the service technician's uh, initials um, on the back part of the tag. Our tags also have the uh, nitrogen symbol um, for compressed gas because the extinguishers are under a uh, compressed gas. This next uh, slide on the left, it says uh, service collar. Um, this is a collar that we place around the neck of the extinguisher. It's when any maintenance is performed. It can only be installed when the extinguisher has been dismantled. Um, it indicates the month and the year uh, the maintenance was completed. So uh, whenever extinguishers are being maintenanced um, by the service technician or the shop technician, uh, this th this collar can only be put on uh, when the extinguisher has been completely dismantled. So if you ever see an extinguisher that has been maintenanced and you don't see this, this service collar, there is a chance that it may not have been maintenanced properly. On the right, we see uh, a hydrostatic test sticker. So we know that there's six year maintenance. Uh, so there's a six year maintenance sticker, but there's also the hydrostatic test uh, sticker. So these are normally found on the back of the extinguishers and um, this specific hydrostatic test uh, sticker, it indicates the pressure in which the extinguisher was tested to. And it also shows, again, the month and the year that the maintenance was uh, conducted. So frequency of maintenance and hydrostatic tests on fire extinguisher. As Lise was talking, there's a wide range and variety of extinguishers on the market and available for different hazards, but not every extinguisher has the same maintenance uh, or hydrostatic test intervals. And uh, these intervals are um, determined by the type of extinguisher, but also the manufacturer's date. Um, it can vary from unit to unit, as we see in this chart here. Uh, for instance, the chemical powder extinguisher, the dates are normally found on the bottom of the extinguisher, stamped, or they're found on the label. We see that the, uh, the maintenance interval is required every six years and hydrostatically tested every 12. The water extinguisher uh, is slightly different than the chemical extinguisher. It's due for its maintenance every five years, but it's actually only a hydrostatic test that's uh, completed. Now its manufacturer's date is usually found on the support or the label of the extinguisher. When we talk about the halogenated agents, uh, they follow the same uh, in intervals as the chemical powder extinguishers. So they require maintenance every six years and again that hydrostatic test every 12. Uh, the manufacturer date is usually found on the label and then uh, when we move on to uh, the carbon dioxide extinguishers, again these are only maintenance every five years and are hy hydrostatically tested every five. Their date is usually found on the top part of the unit and it's usually stamped into the extinguisher and it's painted metallic gray. When we're performing our, our routine annual um, inspections and maintenance and when you guys are performing your own, it's important to know that there's, there's several reasons why some extinguishers may be required to be condemned or possibly removed from service. Some of these reasons might be for instance, the dry chemical stored pressure extinguisher, the NFPA 10 has called for some, some policies and some standards to come into play. And some of these policies and standards are um, that the extinguishers for the dry chemical are removed uh, from service if they're made uh, from 1984 or prior. When we talk about the CO2 extinguishers, um, any CO2 extinguisher that was made prior to 1954 um, 
is required to also be removed. And uh, water extinguishers, not commonly found anymore, but are still out in the industry. Any water extinguisher that was uh, manufactured prior to 1971 uh, also requires to be removed from service. Some of the other factors, um, any extinguisher that would be required to be inverted to operate, uh, any extinguisher that has large dents, has, um, has mechanical injury or corrosion. Um, also when we're uh, doing our maintenance, so at the shop for these extinguishers, if the cylinder threads are worn, broken, cracked or nicked, uh, obviously those extinguishers uh, may not uphold uh, properly when being used, so they need to be uh, condemned also. Also when there's corrosion that uh, may have caused pitting, we also want to condemn or remove any extinguishers that have been subjected to excessive heat, flames, or potentially been placed in a fire condition. We don't see them, but uh, there could be some still out there, and that's the uh, extinguishers where the shell is copper or brass. It's usually joined by soft solder or rivets. And um, lastly, we also want to make sure that any extinguisher um, that has been used for any purpose other than that of a fire extinguisher is definitely uh, removed from service. We're now going to open the floor for questions uh, for Elise and Chris, so please don't hesitate. Um, I have one here that is talking about training, so maybe, um, maybe Chris, you, you want to answer that question. Is there any norms or standard about who should receive a training? Um, there are some specific to uh, pilots and stewardesses. Um, for that best answer, um, you'd be best to direct that to maybe your health and safety officer. Your insurance company or insurance provider or maybe your company may have policies or standards in place that might require you to uh, you or some staff to require some live fire extinguisher training. Um, it's really, um, besides the pilot and the stewardesses, it's really dependent on um, your company or your industry. Okay, thank you. Um, can I use any kind of bracket for an extinguisher, for example, in my vehicle? Uh, maybe, Liz, you want to go ahead with that question? Sure, great question. Uh, no, you can't use any kind of bracket. The extinguishers are tested and listed extensively. It, here in Canada, it's with ULC, which is under Underwriters Laboratories of Canada. They're subject to not just performance testing for knocking down fires under specific conditions and protocols, but vibration, shock, uh, cycle testing, salt spray, and when they go through these tests, the appropriate bracket is tested and listed with specific extinguishers. So they're mated. There's an extinguisher and vehicle bracket that are mated and tested and list listed together. So it's extremely important to use the right extinguisher bracket with the right extinguisher so that the extinguisher does not come loose, particularly on a vehicle where it could actually cause a problem rather than be a solution to a problem. Okay, thank you. And I have one last question here. Uh, maybe at least you can go ahead and also for this question. Is dry chemical harmful? Uh, it is not considered harmful. Um, it has been tested. It is, uh, all the specifics are stated on the MSDS. It is considered a nuisance death. Um, and we, there's been no significant reports of, of any kind of problem other than minor, you know, if somebody as a nuisance test is perhaps um, bothered by, an, you know, an eyewash or something like that will help. But, but no, no long-term damage, no long-term health effects, and it is not considered anything more than nuisance death. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So before concluding this webinar, I just want to thank you, Liz, for being with us today. Um, thank you, Chris, also for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, we invite you to answer uh, the very small survey that will uh, pop up to your screen. It uh, should take one or two minutes of your time, so please uh, take the time to fill that survey. This is going to help us improving our next 
webinars, and, and we have other webinars that is coming this fall uh, on different OHS topics, so uh, let us know your feedback. So if you need more information, uh, if unfortunately we don't have the time to answer some of your questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, you can send me an email uh, directly to me, um, and, and I'll be more than happy to help you. Again, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in another webinar with SDI. Thank you.